Hello, and welcome to this, another episode of Frame and Reference. I'm your host, Kenny McMillan, and today we've got an absolute treat for you. Um, today I am speaking with Claudia Rushka. She is the DP of uh, multiple films, but most recently, uh, Julia, the Julia Child documentary, Fauci, the uh, Dr. Fauci documentary, and also RBG, the uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg documentary. Um, she's done more than that, but those three just bang, 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 you know, all very timely as well. Um, the first two for, or the latter two for obvious reasons, the uh, Julia one is just more um, soul soothing in a way, you know, <laughs> I mentioned in the interview that, um, you know, food content kind of makes people uh, happy and in uncertain times, people watch a lot more food content. Anyway, um, uh, Claudia is um, just so insanely knowledgeable. Um, her body of work is undeniable. And uh, in this conversation, I think we had a borderline illegal amount of fun. So um, I really hope that you'll enjoy listening to it as much as I had. Uh, enjoy listening to it as much as I had having it. Is that a good sentence? I don't know. Point is, um, this is a great one. You're going to learn a lot. You're going to hopefully have some laughs with us. And uh, I'm just going to let you get straight to it. So here it is, my conversation with Claudia Rushka. Yeah, I love how at the beginning of uh, everyone using Zoom, it was just like, record all you want. And then I get an email about a uh, class action lawsuit, and suddenly you have to uh, agree to be recorded. <laughs> I was like, do I want that $20 bill? Mm. Um, you know, the way the way that I like to start the, uh, all these podcasts, although I'm trying to think of a good way to like change it up for the new year because, you know, variety spice life, life and everything. But I did look up, um, you, you said you started as a, uh, dancer. True. You looked up what I did before, huh? Yeah. Um, <laughs> I, I'm really interested to know like kind of how that started, where you kind of went from there and how that maybe shaped your creative brain. My girlfriend's a dancer. Oh, okay. Okay. Uh, what does she do? Does she do, uh, what jazz type? primarily, but, jazz. um, you know, like, Post jazz, everything. jazz, jazz, uh, um, what direction of jazz? I'm going to assume it's modern jazz. Ja modern. And, uh, well, yeah, that's yeah. cool because I was very much into uh, modern dance. So what happened was, <laughs> uh, well, I, uh, when I grew up, I studied all the art forms, sculpting, painting, dancing, music. Um, it was just something I was drawn to, but also because my family was very invested in the arts, but only to a certain degree. Dance was really not permitted until I turned 18. And that is really rough if you want to become a dancer because your career is over by the age of 35 right yeah so um and it was not permitted because you know my great great grandfather had some sort of affair with a vaudeville dancer and so that was just like you don't touch that topic but anyway be that as it may i love dancing i was very much inspired by gene kelly and sure. then uh, decided that i wanted to study dance and it was either amsterdam or it was new york and uh so i came to new york and then studied with martha graham eric hawkins mary anthony i mean all the greats but when you want to become a dancer and you even find a troupe to join or you are invited um you know, you don't get any money. It's just really a breadless uh, um, uh, career until you reach a certain level. And if you're lucky, you get like $5 per performance and a handshake, you know? So during my time, I mean, this is like 40 years ago. So um, when well, I... the basketball teams to dance for. <laughs> 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 and, you know, interesting, because of all my training in uh, dance, um, it is so in my life still, because when I do handheld work, 
um, I constantly check my body position and I make sure that my entire frame is aligned because when you're doing 12 hour verite and you have the weight on your shoulder um, and frankly, now the cameras are not as loaded and, and heavy as they used to be, but nevertheless, you know, gravity pulls on it. And over a period of time, it's an endurance. Um, and so, you know, I check all the time about how I align myself and how to relax my shoulder and my frame so that I can, um, you know, perform ultimately my best. And with that, you know, when you when you're trained as a dancer, it really influences. It influenced me by um, thinking about. Uh, uh, choreography. How do I move with the other characters in the space? What are my obstacles? Like, let's say there's a table or a couch or, you know, a horse or whatever it is. How do I move around maybe something unpredictable? And that kind of really fed into uh, also my training when I did feature films, which I did for 10 years before I went into documentaries, because it's all about blocking and the art right. of blocking is the art of choreography where you come up with a way to uh, ultimately have the cinematography be the, be the subconscious of the story so that your visual strength or the visual storytelling is really maximized by m moving through space. Because as you know, as we all know, you know, uh, when you're watching a film, when you're watching your television screen or your computer, it's 2D. There's nothing 3D about it. So it's the art of choreographing the space so that you feel you're walking through it past edges, past objects, so that you get that sense. And so, you know, my dance uh, uh, training and, and that choreography that I you know, learned and certainly influences me greatly these days. Still, sure. after all can, these years. Yeah. Uh, can you give someone like me who has horrific posture uh, a few tips on uh, how to like check in with your body? Because I because hmm. I know when I hurt, but I don't know when I'm correct. So it's it's really interesting because I also teach master classes at uh, um, the New York Film Academy, and uh, oh, I went there. Oh yeah, yeah, uh, did a so summer course. Okay, specifically for cinema verite, because when you're talking about cinema verite, it is really, um, you have to so spontaneously draw from your uh, different elements. May it be lighting or the technical aspect of, you know, the optics and the exposure, the art of exposure, the art of when to rack focus, and all of that in tune with staying connected with your characters and the story that you want to present, right? Because you are like the portal to what is happening. As a, you know, I'm basically the first viewer of uh, all of the excitement. And so creating that portal um, uh, is fascinating. But to come back to your question, when I uh, work for a long period of time, let's say after a half a day of shooting handheld, what happens is that your core muscles start to relax. And what happens is that your backside, your butt, uh, swings back. And so very often that is a stress relief. Um, and uh, um, But you can also equate it with the, position, the posture of Donald Duck or mm -hmm. Daisy Duck, right? It's like that, putting your rear end uh, backwards. And that Standing is... Standing like a baby. <laughs> it's... And that is the key thing of making sure that you push your hips forward so that you align, you know, your entire frame. And then the other thing is that besides um, uh, aligning your frame, you need to realize if you're swaying over to the right or the left, depending on how you're, you're balancing the camera load and uh, check it, you know, check if you are weighing left or right and, if your, you know, pelvis is pushed back. So once you align that, then you're already 80% there. And then the last tip I would say is 
check your shoulders because sometimes when you hold the camera, uh, so often you try to be very still and smooth and no wiggles. And so you're cramping to counterweigh the inert motion that we have as humans. We always wiggle. We always move. That's part of breathing, right? <laughs> Just breathe. Your heartbeat is going to be seen if you're on a telephoto lens. Your, you know, your breathing is going to be seen if you are anything, you know, further than a 50 uh, millimeter. And so, when you're cramping that way and do the shallow breathing, um, that just mentally checking in with that and saying, "Oh, let me relax my neck." You know, let me just check my frame, make sure I'm centered. Let me hold it. Let me relax my neck. And then (laughs) sometimes when I do that, I actually am my own chiropractor because while I'm having the camera, because it puts a certain weight on it, just two days ago, it went crackle, snap, pop, you know, my (laughs) my neck just fell back into alignment. (laughs) Well, that's good. (laughs) I know, right? I was happy about that. I, I just recently went to the chiropractor for the first time in my life and uh, did actually completely like fix some problems I had from years ago. Uh-huh. But uh, it wasn't from working. It was because, you know, the past two years have been what they were. Uh, I just fell out of shape. And then I tried to do like some sit ups and just completely threw out my hips. Oh, just <laughs> just like a regular workout, just completely threw me off. And I was like, all right, it's been two weeks. I can't walk. I should go fix yeah. this. <laughs> so now yeah. I'm very aware of, uh, you know, trying to, or not, I shouldn't say aware, but I'm, I'm trying to get a lot better with, uh, posture and whatnot. Um, going back to, to kind of the dancing thing again, from what I read, uh, you, you were a photographer at the same time. Did you have, um, kind of influences or was that kind of a, a natural, um, thing that you were just doing for fun or was that kind of like intentional in some way? You know, quite unintentional because I was uh, um, exploring so many different art forms. Photography was one of it. And especially because I printed myself. And so I, you know, did a lot of experimenting with uh, putting sand on the photo paper and then, Mm. you know, kind of... uh, different kinds of exposure with dots and, and, you know, kind of like shaping it It was more in alignment with doing my sculpting work. I did do some work with stone as well as with clay. And so it felt very similar. I liked the tactileness of the whole process and um, yeah, you know, I loved it. I mostly did black and white. And so when I came to the United States, of course, it was one of my go-to thing to just capture uh, what I would see. And that we, you know, it was like, I think it was 1982 or 83. There was like this massive uh, water uh, pipe uh, that that burst in downtown Manhattan. And I just happened to be uh, waitressing because that was one of my ways of how, how I could uh, survive being a dancer. And so I took all of these puddle photos that were reverse and so the trucks that were driving through it all of their um you know advertising the signs were upside down and backwards and it looked like as if it was in a different country and so it was just that kind of playfulness uh, and i you know i showed my photos to um my colleagues at uh, the restaurant or my co-workers and we had a part-time um, bartender who was also a cinemat- part-time cinematography teacher at Columbia University. And he saw my photos and he was like, oh my God, you have such a great eye for, for composition. You know, have you ever thought about cinematography? And I'm like, I don't know what that is. Sorry. I, you know, I really have no clue. What is it? He's like, like well, I you love know, French. <laughs> Uh, and it was like, you know, here I was on the path of being a dancer and somebody opened the window to the side and say, hey, look out here. This might be interesting to you. And so I pretty much went just like Alice in Wonderland through that rabbit hole and uh, never left. And, you know, it is my from that day on. And this is 40 years ago. I 
basically I went on set. It was transformational for me to see how my dancing, my sculpting, painting with light, uh, being part of a team, which is also the same thing when you're a dancer, all kind of came together. And uh, then and there, I just decided that cinematography was it. And I never went off in any other direction. What uh, what did you learn in the darkroom? Because I loved uh, I took, you know, I, I suppose I've been a photographer my whole life, but um, uh-huh. you, printing my own photos in college was definitely like it's the most fun part. You almost don't like I almost this is actually part. Maybe it's partially the reason why I became a. Uh, a part-time colorist was because it feels much more like the dark room where it's like, you get to play with the image and it's, and it's a lot less stressful. They're like, I don't like that. You're like, okay, fine. Change it up. You know, it's not like, I don't like that shot. And you're like, damn it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I find like nowadays when I take any snapshots, you know, that magic of the dark room is, uh, has certainly transformed because there's a lot that you can do with filters and, you know, manipulating the curve and, and pulling in, you know, rich blacks and, you know, blossoming highlights as if you're silver printing or anything. Uh, like noir, there's certain um, curves that you can just apply. And so it's so much simpler. I think the dark room really taught me that it is, uh, one, a, a really unforgiving uh, process <laughs> because you make a mistake, that's it. Um, and that, uh, the, the printing process of, of just finding the right exposure so that all the zones really fall into place, um, you know, takes some time getting used to. And, and I ultimately didn't have the patience for that nitty gritty fine tuning. I was more of a, let's see what happens if I do this, you know? And, uh, uh, and I enjoyed that. I mean, I did learn a lot. I did learn that paper is key. I find that, uh, uh, you know, using the right kind of paper is fantastic. And then it's also access. You know, you've got to have a dark room to really grow as a, as a photographer if you're doing your own printing. And so um, once I was in New York, I didn't have the space. I was, you know, sharing with roommates. There was no way that I could create a dark room and renting a dark room or signing in for certain hours was a bit expensive. So it, it very quickly... Um, my darkroom experience ended. uh, And so I just had, you know, different photo labs, print whatever I needed. And and then I got pretty quickly into uh, printing lights of communicating because I started, once I started shooting feature films uh, and you get your dailies and you talk to the timer and you're doing your answer print, then you really start understanding the printing process for uh, your answer print and then for your release print and, you know, the the whatever film stock for the one doesn't necessarily mean it looks great on another uh, once they do the release print. So that was um, a different phase. Yeah, I'm actually uh, fascinated by that because we've had a few um, DPs come on the show who, you know, started with film. And um, I'm, I'm interested in knowing what your sort of perspective is on because everyone these days seems to want, you know, the film look. We all want it to look like film, which I personally think has now aged out. I don't think people want the film look anymore. They just want a nostalgic look. Like when we were shooting on DV or whatever, of course we wanted it to look like film because nothing was better. But now that digital's perfect, I have kids coming to me and going, how'd you get that DV look? And I'm like, I shot on an XL2. Like, <laughs> because they grew up with it, you know? Yes. Um, but... <laughs> <laughs> to the initial, po- I know it's ridiculous. Uh, to the initial question, just um, what processes do you uh, find that you've carried over that have helped you in the digital world, whether it be exposure or workflow or, um, you know, that knowledge of doing uh, working with a colorist or anything like that? It has changed so, so much. You know, these days when I shoot uh, raw or in log and I uh, have a a project that I do the color correction on, um, depending on how much time I get allotted by the, you know, post supervisor, um, there's so much you can do. And I think what I carried over from the, uh, just as an understanding of um, 
you know, the colors of how they intertwine and I can easily, uh, and actually it's funny to this day, I still say a point less magenta. <laughs> I still go by points. <laughs> no. And my colorist always go like, what do you mean? It's like, well, a point, you know, it's like printing points. It's like, yeah. but anyhow, be that as it may. That is really it. It's really maybe the understanding of that uh, there is a certain amount of latitude with uh, what you shot on, if you shot in 4K or just straight HD or, uh, you know, what the latitude is of uh, your particular project. And then it is really all about sensor technology. And that is very similar to me um, in terms of uh, working with a negative, just understanding how the pixel technology of different uh, cameras um, kind of translate light. And, you know, where it was a chemical process and now it is a, you know, um, an electricity process of where the photons just kind of ignite the sensor to create a current and uh, that is your you know exposure and might that be at the toe of your uh, sensitometry curve or might it be the shoulder you know it is it is where that all comes together um because obviously you know you there's like in in terms of exposure and latitude when you're talking about sensitometry you know that most of your action is going to take place in the straight line which is you know um the straightforward uh stop by stop reliable um you know uh exposure but a lot of the shadow magic and a lot of the highlight roll off is really where these days the sensors uh, very greatly. And yeah. I have to say that I have been really astonished by how much the Canon sensor has pushed up into that field of being one of the top sensor technologies because their roll off is in highlights is now so soft and has so many gradation and also in the toe, you know, which is uh, first exposure, you know, the whole magic in, uh, in the shadows is just beautiful, you know? So I end up often underexposing uh, a little bit because the sensors are so, so great. I actually, so I'm uh, shooting on a C500, well, shooting webcamming on a C500, the most overkill webcam in the history of webcams. Um, <laughs> yeah, I'd say. Do, <laughs> yeah. Do you, uh, do you have any, t I mean, I've used, I've been working with this for, uh, how, I guess since it came out, I think I have serial number eight. Um, oh, wow. Yeah, I was on it. Nice. Uh, but uh, do you have any tips? <laughs> I know, right? I need to get the engineers to sign the inside of it or something. Um, do you have any tips on exposing this one? Because I found kind of the same thing where um, I used to do the film thing of just like put the skin a stop over and then I'll drag it down in post. But more recently, I'm finding I put it all at middle I put, I put it dead in the center and it works a little bit better for me, but uh, maybe I'm doing it wrong from your experience. No, I, I agree with you. I uh, hardly ever overexpose skin any longer just because the it, it performs the best when you're either right on the money or when you're actually a little bit uh, under. And, you know, it's always such a it's such a tricky thing when you're talking about uh, exposure because, uh, you know, many people who start learning, like my students, they use the zebras and, and I'm, you know, I keep trying to impress on them that skin tone yes <laughs> but you know with documentaries that's one thing if you have total control of a set and you can use your light meter and your spot meter but when you are doing cinema verite it is so much of it is intuitive and you just have to have that basic knowledge of quickly adjusting your either iso to compensate or your f-stop to uh, pull it into the right range, right? And very often when you use like these uh, functions of um, the, the waveform or you're using the zebras, you know, dialed into whatever percentage because you think that will give you that guarantee, 
the truth of it is you can have, you know, your zebras dialed into, let's say, 60 percent if you're not shooting log, um, you know, 60 percent, like even if you say like 55 percent or 60 percent. Right. Uh, so it's just a little bit under what people usually go for in terms of, uh, um, you know, Caucasian reflectiveness. Um, and then that person steps into the shadow. Right. right? Or then that person steps into the bright sunlight. So it, it, it is no guarantee. You have to always think of the uh, entire world as an entire grayscale is represented. And you need to understand where what zone is in order to find your best exposure. And is the person really uh, in the key light that you want to expose it for? Then maybe 65% uh, on the zebra will work for you. But beyond that, it just is, for me, irritating to see all, all of these, uh, uh, <laughs> yeah. you know, helpers. And so I... I do use it uh, uh, usually at 100% just as a warning so that when it does pop up, especially in Verite, I know with my left eye, I see, oh, this is a window or this is a white wall with sun hitting it. No right. wonder it's peaking at, at 100%. And so then I adjust it so that I don't have um, the loss of information there. But that's it. And, and beyond that, I... Just really, um, if I do eyeball interviews, it. yeah, it's like I eyeball it. But if I use it for interviews or if somebody is a longer uh, conversation, I do use sometimes a waveform because I shoot log. And then I, I try to have the skin tones no higher than 50. Yeah. It's like 45, 50, you know, it's like kind of my base. Do you... Uh specifically with the c5 i don't know the 300 did it but um have you been using the false color because i found that kind of as a replacement of for my spot meter right right uh, you know it's interesting i actually am not a fan of false color interesting and okay that, and then that has to do with that i live and breathe very much of the way the uh the color works that gives me uh, sometimes a better clue in, um, you know, I know you can program it so that it, it pops in and out, but uh, um, it, for me, it's color is like a very sensitive thing. And I, I like really how I can see mixed color work. And so that is for me more of an alarm. And that actually comes from not being able to adjust when I was shooting on a negative the mixed color that was so detrimental. It was like so important to even out all of your different color temperatures within a, uh, a set, you know, yeah. just gelling the windows or putting out another filter and cutting down your exposure possibilities that way. You know, it's like, uh, I find these days I just look and it, you were talking about the uh, Canon uh, C500 what an amazing LCD they have. It is it's so, nice. Oh my God. So in love with that. But I also really enjoy working with their uh, viewfinder, the Canon uh, V70. It's just beautiful. I thought that that is a game changer. For me, when I'm inside and I do Verite, I only use the LCD because it is so accurate and, and sharp and you know, I see my mixed colors right away and see what I can get away with. Yeah, the uh, the viewfinder is definitely on my list when I can afford one. Uh, I mean, I, guess <laughs> I know the problem that, is I have my own package, so it's like ah, I could rent one, but <laughs> I just want. I know. It. You know, it's so interesting. When I started out, no, okay, I'm I'm obviously a woman, um, and yes, my pronouns are she and uh, her, um, but. Uh, um, when I started out in the business, because there were only 10 established female cinematographers in the field, I contacted them all when I started out in the 80s, trying to get a foot in the door by just saying, hey, can I just shadow you on set? I don't, I, I'm happy to, to work for free if I can just see how you won the set and you know, how it all works. And uh, specific, specifically, Diana Taylor, who uh, was really my hero at that point, she let me um, 
visit her on set and then ended up hiring me as well as a camera assistant. And so we, you know, she took me under her wings that way. What a dream that is. I'm sorry. To look up to someone and then work for them, like that must yeah, be, like, I know that awesome. was, and it was also during that time. I mean, you know, again, there were so few camera women out in the field that um, everybody said to me, "You know what? If you want to get anywhere in this industry, little lady, then yeah. you better, <laughs> then you better have your own gear because that's the only chance you're going to get hired." And I saw my friends invest in, you know, the Aton packages and whatnot. And the cost that they would get is like, hey, we have this great project. Uh, we'll pay you for the camera, but we can't pay you anything. <laughs> and I thought, look, I'm already having a hard time as a woman starting out in the field. So I wanted to make sure that this whole gender thing was not part of it, that I actually would get hired for my skills as an artist, as a visual artist, rather than for the gender issue. And uh, I didn't want to have the camera be kind of like the go-between. So it excluded from the get-go a lot of opportunities. Um, sure. But the people who did call me um, hired me for who I was and what I brought to the table. And that was a great confidence builder. And when you look back at my career, I mean, I did after I uh, decided on that magical day in 1982 to become a cinematographer. I mean, I worked my way up the ladder and I shot for four years at Columbia University thesis films until, you know, these scout agents, uh, which came to the screenings, saw what I did and signed me. And that was a confident boost. And from that point onward, it was uh, um, a much uh, easier way to step into the field. Not that it is, uh, it wasn't handed to me in that way. You know, you still, no matter what, it doesn't matter uh, where you're at in your career, you still have to uh, kind of find your own voice. Yeah, it's, you know, the, um, the gear question is always one that gets repeated, especially for younger filmmakers. Uh, and it's something I even think about all the time. Um, but nowadays I, it's so much more affordable. Yeah. Yeah. Oh goodness. I mean, like there's one thing to own, you know, like a, a Penelope and then have to still get the film. But now, you know, goodness, a C70, I've been telling people like, if, if you want to, if you, ha if you can afford it, you know, cause obviously there's still some barrier to entry, but like, if you can afford a C70, you're right? done. You're done. You can I shoot whatever that's... you want. Exactly. It's a beautiful camera. It has the same, you know, uh, Kodak and uh, uh, sensor technology than the uh, uh, C300 Mark III. Yeah, exactly. And that's a $10,000 sensor you have in that camera. You know, that's not. And I think the price of the C70 uh, is, what is it right now? Like around six grand? Six. Yeah. And that's what I bought my C100 Mark II at. Yeah. And yeah, I yeah. think that was the C500 original sensor, or at least the C300 original sensor, which I liked because, you know, shot to SD cards and it was small and used regular mm -hmm. batteries and it was and all that. But even so, like there were limitations, you know, no yeah. 4K, which, eh, you know, it doesn't really matter. But these days kind of does. Um, it does. Yeah. I mean, especially I mean, that's because Netflix and so many of the uh, distributors now uh, have their, uh, you know, their resolution you know, demands right. of what you have to shoot on and, and even check off what camera you can use. You know? Well, and it's so, f it's funny because, uh, that is something like with the internet being what it is, everyone always wants to prepare. There's this innate uh, need to be prepared. And so people will be on Reddit or whatever, like, Oh, what camera should I get? These ones are Netflix approved. And it's like, Oh, which, which films have you shot? And they're like, I haven't yet. It's like, well, <laughs> I don't know if you have to worry about what Netflix wants yet. You, know, <laughs> yeah. you can do whatever you want right now. So true. So true. Yeah. Did, uh, it's, uh, kind of a weird, um, turn, but, uh, tell me about your time on Pee Wee's Playhouse. <laughs> it is so funny. People are always asking me about what you, you, Be Listen, IMDb. It's the last one. You just go, hey, there it is. 
<laughs> it always comes back up. Yeah, I was uh, at that point. I was a camera assistant, and uh, um, it was a multiple camera shoot, very much like a classic. You know, on on these rolling pods and able to quickly adjust. Uh, um, it was really fun. I mean, you know, um, I think the the again for me it was very much mirroring what uh, happened to me when I joined this initial magical day on set where uh there is a um it's a, it's like not a tipping point it's just like this this magical line of where you know you're with the crew and you're making everything happen and it's like gritty and and sweaty and then the director calls action and then there's magic and you are in make belief and it's beautiful and it looks gorgeous and the camera moves around and it was Similar in, at Pee Wee's Playhouse, where you have the genie, who of course is a real man, just you know, with the makeup on the head, but then underneath and shorts and you know, a T-shirt. <laughs> that wasn't that uh, Morpheus, the, name. <laughs> the guy who played Morpheus. Oh no, that was Cowboy Curtis. Was uh, was uh, but you know, it's like these these uh, um, characters that appeared or the chair, the comfy chair, you know, with the arms or the little robot. I mean, there's no people in there, you know, cramped for hours, waiting for the cue, take after take. But we had so much fun. It was a great camaraderie and partially because uh, Pee Wee made it so. He was very much into acting with the crew and uh, very normal, but with a sense of humor uh, we had I had the best time, I really have to say. It was kind of a very colorful set and, and a great crew, especially the puppeteers were amazing. Yeah. What did you uh, learn from a production side from that experience? And what did you learn from like a directing or, or a sort of top upper level side? Um, well, keep in mind, I was a camera assistant, so I just did what I was told. Sure. But- <laughs> from observation, you know, because we would all but, love to know- be on any set, you know. <laughs> exactly. But I think, uh, um, you know, it was, it, the, the set was run fairly smoothly, as I remember. Um, and uh, from a production point of view, there wasn't really any, uh, um, you know, I've been on sets where uh, the crew did not feel respected or neglected in a sense of where they uh, didn't give uh, a promised breaks, you know, on time or went endlessly into overtime. And, you know, it was a unionized uh, set. And as far as I remember, we are a shop steward, you know, it's like, there was no problem when we would go over. It was just, you know, 15 minutes into meal break penalty and uh, everybody was asked and was pretty much above board. But um, from a directing point of view, I think... Um, I don't really recall the director at all. Sure. <laughs> I recall Pee Wee pretty much doing what he wanted to do. And he was really in charge of when he felt it was good or when he wanted another take. Mm-hmm. And I do remember that the genies, <laughs> sometimes those damn doors would jam. Gina would try to open up and ask the genie for advice and the door wouldn't open up (laughs) things like that you know uh, that kind of are memorable but um, it was not a big set it was pretty small you know yeah the kind of going back to the um, camera thing and and, uh, sort of young filmmakers one thing about uh, Julia that I noticed was uh, really great food cinematography. And the yeah, one yeah. thing that YouTube loves is B-roll. B-roll has become the A-roll for a lot of filmmakers. And I think it's just because no one, it's a lot easier to do B-roll than to write a script, you know? Yeah. Um, but I was kind of wondering just to kind of kick off the questioning of the films. Um, how did you approach shooting that? And like, were you, were you bringing any um, influences in or were you just kind of like, cause that's just pure, I mean, literal f- food porn. You get to do whatever you want, you know, um, make it look as pretty as you can. So like, what was your approach there? Well, 
it's it's really interesting because Betsy and Julie and I, we certainly had some conversations about how we would approach the food. And they were pretty much set on that they wanted to be um, abstract, where you kind of didn't know what it was at first. Mm. And so they were looking for a, uh, you know, a commercial uh, cinematographer who could provide that. And so they had a friend recommend a Parisian um, cinematographer who specialized on abstract food um, shoots. And uh, and he was fantastic. It's uh, Nanda, I always say his last name, Nanda Fernandez uh, Brilliard, I think is his last name, pronounced correctly. But uh, um, forgive me, Nanda, if I <laughs> mispronounced your name. But anyway, I really thought that he was the right fit. He was just excellent at uh, bringing these macro shots uh, into the world because, um, but it's kind of like the cherry on top, you know? It's like you have to build up to that moment. And that certainly fell into my lap. And we also knew from the get-go that we had certain recipes where we would be going step by step, where we would have Susan, um, you know, our, our food specialist and cook, uh, do go and and go through these steps so all of that needed to have a, a it was kind of like a trans- transition element of coming from the archival footage of julia in the kitchen to susan handling just with her hands and obviously not seeing and revealing her face in julia's uh, um, recreated kitchen that go between that then was kind of like with a cherry on top by uh, Nanda, you know? And so it all kind of intertwined in a beautiful way. And I know you asked me another part of this question was what were my influences? Yeah. As I, I was assuming uh, that you had uh, shot those sequences, but I suppose um, with any film, you know, I feel like a lot of people, maybe you didn't, but um pull in sort of visual references or, or something like that. Like not necessarily we want it to look like this, but this is kind of the vibe that we're going for. And I was wondering if you had any of those. And we did, I mean, again, Julie, Betsy and I, we did talk about it and uh, uh, Betsy and Julie were very adamant about that. They didn't want to have it look like uh, 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 the chef's uh, uh, Chef's table. Chef's table. They didn't want it to be presented that way. And uh, um, they wanted to have a different way of getting to the food. And I said to them, like, look, I mean, food is emotional. You know, you eat something, you have an experience, and you want to present it to the audience as such. And so how can we visually capture the aroma? Uh, Because obviously they can't taste it. And how can we, uh, you know, activate their their sense of, of uh, yearning to taste it and their sense of uh, that they can nearly smell it, right? How can you make that work? And uh, um, so there were elements in Chef's Table. There was a very first episode which uh, really struck me because there's one tiny shot in it where the camera floats. And as it floats, it's verite, and as it floats, I felt as the viewer, um, as if I could smell it. It was that vapor, you know, it's just translated through a slight camera move. And so I was very much inspired by that. But yet, because I didn't want it to look like that, which was really referring to lighting, um, I knew that I had to uh, work more uh, to anchor julia's kitchen in reality meaning period faded colors um more period lighting which is more source motivated of uh, a door a window a a slash of light uh, um, and using that as consistent motivations to backlight it and uh, give it a certain glow and but then bringing that element of doing handheld work and really trying to capture it as it happens, that was my take on creating that bridge so yeah. that the audience 
feels as if you're with your mom or with your grandma or with, with, you know, somebody who cooks really well in your family and you are somewhat just watching and salivating and uh, can't wait until it is being presented to you so that you can take a bite. And I thought we were very successful. Yeah, yeah, no, it's 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 all gorgeous. Uh, I think I remember. And you know what? In terms of, I'm sorry to interrupt. In terms no, of no. the the macro photography of Nanda, there were uh, he because um, uh, he used a different camera than I did uh, in Paris, and you see, it was during COVID, and so nobody could fly over. It was all via telephone communication, and uh, then he would send us the images in in log of what he had shot. But he also shot everything against a black background. And so the contrast level uh, was of a different nature. And when you're doing macro uh, commercial photography, very often it is not, uh, it, you have, you know, certain ways of uh, substituting certain, you know, more glistening uh, ingredients than right. actually what is used. Whereas coming from uh, Julia, uh, that was, it was very much everybody can do this. This is how it really looks like. And so in the kitchen, um, and we shot also plenty of close-ups in that kitchen without hands in there. But, um, you know, the approach was, again, it was period. So there were no pure blacks. And I felt right. that that was really important you know, to uh, find that transition so that Nanda's footage would really stand out as the ultimate food porn. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, I think it was, um, it might have been Anthony Bourdain who said that it was the explosion of Food Network was likely due to 9-11 because mm -hmm. people wanted to find comfort. Yeah. Um, and I'm noticing kind of the same thing now where you know great british bake-off for instance is oh, yeah. everyone's about it and stuff like that um yeah. and i and i found that the julia documentary does give you kind of that same uh joy joyful feeling yes yes and, and learning she was kind of a naughty lady like that's kind of fun you know <laughs> i know but look you know and if you look at the recent films that i was really um engaged in uh they're kind I of am. intense. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but they're also very often by, you know, about um, feminists or leading women that mm. established their own path. And in a way, I identify so much with that because I had to do the same thing. I had to establish my own path um, because there were so few women in the field. And, you know, even... Today, I still have to assure that, you know, I can handle all technology that's being thrown at me and any kind of situation. But uh, um, that makes you look at uh, other people with much more appreciation. So when I embarked on telling the story visually with uh, about Julia Child, um, that was key. And really being able to identify with her and, and seeing a bit of myself in her um of uh you know being a bit too tall <laughs> sure i'm I, not that i'm that tall i'm not six foot two but i am uh you know five ten and so when you put some shoes even sneakers even me. Flat yeah. shoes, <laughs> then you you end up being pretty tall and uh, um you know that that can be you stick out let me just say it you just stick out when you're tall. And so uh, not necessarily, uh, you know, for me, it was also, uh, <laughs> I don't know if I want to really go into that. I'm going to sidestep my, my inner thoughts on that topic of appearance. Sure. <laughs> but, uh, uh, you know, Julia Child was just not considered a beauty. And she didn't fit into what was asked of her, partially because of her height and partially because of her, you know, rebellion and rebellion against her parents of what they asked uh, of her, of getting married at that time period when she was, you know, um, supposed to get married. 
And she didn't, you know, she, she was not interested in that. And she found her own path. And I really related to that uh, tremendously. Um, so I was highly motivated to uh, do her justice. And I think the film really does, you know, because everybody who succeeds in one way or another um, uh, kind of inspires those who follow suit, right? And her having a career blossom at 50, that is late in the game for, you know, many people. And uh, um, I, I think, you know, her nature of things shit happens and things fall down and you know and just pick it back up this lightheartedness of embracing one's own mistakes um is is a key element to success that you can if you understand that uh, um you won't be perfect and that when you make a mistake you own it and you don't own it with with shame. I mean, I'm talking about mistakes that obviously don't harm other people, but mistakes right. in terms of your own performance. But you own it and you have a sense of humor about it. You become vulnerable and so much more approachable. And if you are approachable, people are willing to give you, you know, the support that you need to succeed. So I thought that's a, it's a brilliant message. Yeah, that's genuinely one of the things that I uh, was. That was a huge lesson for me. That you know, I, don't, I hesitate to say changed my life because that's such like a strong statement. But um, being able to to not so much admit fault because that was easy for me. It was not carrying that burden of the 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 failure with me. And treating it like a lesson. Okay, did I learn the lesson? Yes. Do I know what it is? Cool. I can let go of the failure itself. You don't need to carry, you yeah. know, it's like the way I heard it described was, um, actually, this is the way uh, religion was described to me, but it's the same concept. It's you get across the river with a boat. You don't need to carry the boat with you. Yeah, After you exactly. get to the other side. That's silly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Exactly. So well put. Yeah, yeah. I feel, um, and, I, and I can echo that. I mean, you know, the strive, maybe, I don't really know how it affects men in our society. I know that there are social norms that everybody wants to live up to and that are, you know, in our books and our schooling and our be, in the behavior, uh, sometimes just so, you know, uh, they're like blind spots. You're just being taught something without really asking if it's valid. Yeah. But, um when you understand that you are imperfect and therefore have the power to embrace your imperfection in a society that teaches you ultimately always to be perfect and specifically women to be perfect because there is unfortunately this uh, um, <sighs> worth or value system that is placed on women's uh, uh, appearance of um, you have worth if you are beautiful and sexy. And that is your currency that you are trying to negotiate and, you know, move forward. But it doesn't really embrace of how smart you are. And very often, if you are um, showing that you are really brilliant and smart, then it's being held against you. Or if you're really determined and, and uh, a tough negotiator, well, then you might end up being called a bitch. Right. And if you are, uh, you know, not standing, or if you are even daring on set to speak up and say like, nope, I, I disagree with the director and the producer, you're making the wrong choice. Ooh, you better fall in line, right. girl. You step just one step too far over the line. Whereas I see and I have seen through all of my years in the in the business that uh, that's much more forgiven for men. That's kind of like, you know, the the bonding that takes place of the, the wrestling of, you know, um, you know, I have this opinion, you have that opinion. But they have that, that kind of uh, communication set from the get-go. That's part of how they communicate. They can just be direct. But as a yeah. woman, you're not allowed to be that direct without, you know, upsetting 
<laughs> some some people's toes. Some sensitive people. Yeah, I uh, I will say for men, it's interesting. You uh, if you are sensitive on the offset, I was a pretty sensitive kid growing up, mm-hmm. and you don't communicate in that kind of rough housing direct way. Uh, you you're out. You don't get invited to the friend groups. You don't, you get kicked out immediately. Um, in regards to it, that was very frustrating. I had to learn how to be like masculine, I, I suppose, in, in the, in the very to, coarse way, yeah, you know, fit into a certain norm. And I also had to adapt. Um, it was very tricky because here you are on the set that is predominantly, you know, men, except for maybe the makeup or the wardrobe department. Um, yeah. You know, and you, you think you can step into that masculine behavior, but you're not allowed to because as a woman, or at least now it's not so much, but then when I started out, there was very strict behavior that was tolerated and everything else was, you know, like, hmm, you know, she's right. over, overstretching her <laughs> welcome here. <laughs> yeah. Have you found that it's gotten better over the years? Because, I mean, going back to the idea of, of the way you look, too, like, goodness, I, it seems like um, every industry is more looks driven than ever. You know, you look at, you know, in, in the influencer economy is mostly hot chicks in bikinis. Like my goodness, yes, that has become the currency. Absolutely. It's the eye candy, you know, and it's because there's an overflow of information. And so obviously, you know, the audience is, is attracted to something specific, but it only lasts so long. If sure. you don't deliver, no matter how you look, if you don't deliver the goods with uh, some wit and some some laughter, People are not going to stay. They're not going to stick around for the blog or whatever you're trying to uh, communicate. You know, so I think it just uh, lasts maybe for the door to be opened. You know, sure. And that yeah. is already a great thing. But I mean, you know, it is. Look, our our film industry is a youth-oriented industry. It has always been. And once you get uh, to the level of where you're really experienced, then um, what counts is really your work, your body of work. And, uh, uh, and then how you uh, adapt to the different challenges. And it's just, I find that people, when I started out, they were at times, there were just so many expectations on either side, producing, directing, crew, that would butt heads, you know, where all of a sudden everybody felt, oh, I'm disrespected right, <laughs> you know, oh, or whatever. <laughs> but, you know, and I understand that because they had all their expectations. But when you have been in the industry for a while, and I have been in the industry for 40 years, nearly 40 years, 38 years to be exact, you know, it's, uh Yeah. No, it's nearly 40 years. 82. Yeah, 22 next year. Crazy. Goodness. Yeah, but a couple of those years disappeared on us. <laughs> true, true. But, you know, you have a different perspective. And I find, and maybe because it's my extensive training in documentaries, because you meet so many different characters and because uh, the, the diplomacy that is asked of me as a self-directed camera woman when I'm doing cinema verite, just that that uh, sensitivity to really understand somebody's emotional pulse, right? That you have so much more empathy and yeah. therefore you can quickly decipher uh, why people try to set limits and, and you know, doesn't matter if it's a a budgetary thing or if it is a schedule thing or if they want to limit something you have a better understanding and therefore the communication can be much more focused so that the other entity let's say the producers are like oh we don't have that money for that you know it's it's like it's not putting heads any longer it's a, a, a more of a recognition of well this project has this amount of funding and uh, if this is really necessary how can we make the other parts work and so it becomes a much more focused conversation and much more of a, uh, there's more access to a quicker solution 
just because the experience that you bring to the table. And that is very different from when you're starting out yeah. because you, you haven't done enough projects to compare them and to really understand how to fine tune, um, you know, the conversations. Yeah, that's a, a toughie, especially because, uh, correct me if, if this isn't the case, but there are certain situations where the answer is not like, you know, like we were talking about, everyone likes to be really prepared. Um, sometimes the answer is there's no preparation. You just have to, to do it. You know, I can tell you how to snowboard, but until you're on the mountain, it, you're not going to experience what it's like to slide around. You know, I can't tell you what a toe edge feels like. Um, <laughs> is that kind of the same case, like getting on set? Is there like, you know, a book someone could read or maybe some therapy someone could do to figure out how to get close before they step on set? Or is that mostly just like a, you're going to get punched in the jaw and that's how it's going to go? You know, I always uh, uh, try to relate it to when you are an artist, what counts is your body of work. Nobody is going to say like, oh, you have a degree in what, let me see your art. Yeah. That's the question, right? So doing it is really the key. Uh, to build your experience and to really be able to negotiate um, your career. There's not, yes, you can have a lot of book knowledge. And certainly these days there are so many videos available if you want to get familiar with certain cameras or you can, you know, dive definitely into the, the technology of the, the sensor technology or the optics or, you know, all of that is available on the internet and it gives you a base, but it, keeps you very hungry i'd say keeps yes. you hungry in order to to really be involved because when you're uh learning you have uh your your have your own timeline you can go and get a snack and then maybe tomorrow you see the other half of that video but when you're on set it is rapid fire it is here's the situation go do it and I think that is really uh, where everything is tested. And that is where the experience of what to let go of. If you're saying, like, oh, I have this great idea. I want to do these cool rack focuses. And then you're on set and you're doing your first rack focus and you don't hit the end mark right. Or it oh. was <laughs> too late. And then the person already moved. Then you have lost that entire moment. And so certain conceptual or, you know, uh, cinematic approaches just fly right out the window because there's not the time there to do so. And you, you find your way when it is appropriate to play cinematically and when it is just meat and potatoes because the emotional dynamic is demanding of a different style of cinematography. And, yeah. and, and knowing what to let go of and how to, to you know, forge forward is, uh, is only possible once you've had experience because you understand the timing of things. And you, once you step on set, that emotional dynamic will present itself. And you can sense when something drastically happens, when, you know, some sort of major tipping point is happening because... The key thing is that you're listening. You're not only watching body language, which for me as a dancer is, is key. Sure. You know, for me, that is, oh, he's about to duck, swing the camera over, right? <laughs> and, and having my, you know, with... Oh, that's uh, actually fascinating. <laughs> I didn't even think about that, but you can watch the subject and know how they're going to move. Oh, that's cool. That's really yeah. cool. It, and it is, and, you know, thank goodness, if you, if you look back in time and you have that eyepiece, and even with the... With the uh, Canon uh, viewfinder, the, the V70, you know, it's like how your peripheral vision is not there. And you probably are going to squint too in order to, you know, <laughs> just focus on what you're focusing. Um, but with the LCD of the, you know, uh, the new uh, Canon C500, that is amazing because it frees you up. All your periphery is ready. I can see somebody reacting right over here or making a move, which then motivates me. I know, oh, three, two, one, he's entering. I can start and hide my camera motion on my stepping with that person who's entering and that person will lead me down and I can then let them go and end up in a close-up on another subject. 
right? So all of that, using your periphery that way, and when I am in a uh, dialogue-driven scene, it is so important um, to not chase the conversation, but to have the timing that you can listen and know what's happening before the other person. Uh, if they're only interjecting, you let that go. But if they're really starting to ramp up for an oppositional statement, then you can make your move of rotating around, going over the shoulder, passing past the shoulder. I mean, it's, it's so delicious. I, I am really a big fan of verite. Yeah, well, and it's the fun part. I was going to say the 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 being able to see everywhere is the reason why I like shooting my uh, my viewfinder stills camera because you get that yeah. big area around it and really helps with composition. But um, it is that that weird thing of trying to make verite cinematic, right? Because in in a in a scripted sense, you know that person's going to enter the door, so you can set that up. But being able yeah. to anticipate it in the moment is is absolutely a, a a learned skill but also just one that is um i think valuable to anyone even if you're just trying to get into i, I correct me if if i'm wrong but i would argue that shooting a lot of verite would absolutely make you a better scripted uh cinematographer hmm, interesting you know so because i um I would have to think about that. Since I I started out in uh, doing 10 years feature films yeah. uh, and being trained to really conceptualize, you know, the dolly, the move in and around and the coverage and the line, the 180 rule line in terms of uh, not crossing the line or when you do a transition shot and so on and so forth. That for me was key to do good coverage when you do verite. I'm, I'm going to revise my statement. Uh, <laughs> having that base, I mean, then I'm going to, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have interrupted you, but now I'm. No, that's okay, okay, go ahead, go um, ahead. But I was, I'm coming from the perspective of, I went to film school and I had, I, I won't say I have the same base knowledge you do, but the, the cinematic language was beat into me yeah. before I did, I wouldn't say documentary, but just doing anything where it's kind of like run and gun kind of, hey, we're going to shoot this commercial for, yeah. I don't know, a, a, an apartment, you know, and you just kind of have to, ah, okay, bah, you know, and you're always handheld and stuff is yeah. more what I was talking about. Not starting as a documentarian, but I'm sorry. I should not have interrupted you. That was my, it, that's all, that was, that's all okay. I, I like the spontaneous uh, uh, conversation because they're very lively that way. Um, I don't mind it. In other words, you can interject anytime. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so yeah. I, so for me, that knowledge that I gained through the feature films was all about coverage, all about the line, and be very uh, sharp of when you know you're crossing the line and why you're crossing the line. Is there a real uh, shift in the scene where you can make that work? And traditionally, people don't cross the line in uh, in, in feature films, in dramatic work. That's a no-no, unless you can give the audience an orientation where that it becomes part of the style of where they can accept from the get-go. Oh, I know the layout of, you know, this particular uh, scene of where the windows are, where the doors are, so that if you move back and forth across the line, then it becomes a style and the audience doesn't lose their perspective. That's key. But I learned that on uh, when I was shooting feature films. And in terms, therefore it helped me tremendously to be spontaneous because in the back of my mind, I was saying like, okay, I'm on the line, but I'm not across the line. You know, I can go there because he just crossed the line. So that's the natural transition. All of that really helped me to be spontaneous. And also with lighting, I mean, the amount of lighting that you do in a controlled set, um, you learn very quickly that, hey, I can't put my camera angle here. That means I have to do a whole relight. You know, I can't just, the, the director says, well, you know, I want to shoot in sequence. And you go like, oh my gosh, <laughs> shoot in sequence. Are you out of your mind? You know how many relights? We don't have the hours in the day to do that, right? right? So you learn very quickly of how to truncate and jump in, in uh, the, you know, the timeline in order to not have these relights. And that 
inform me again when I'm on set and I'm shooting something. I always think of the real light, but there are no lights. You know what I mean? It's like, that's the, that's the amazing thing. There are no lights. It's all natural lighting. But I'm thinking of the relight because I'm thinking, oh, the sun is going to be moving. And if I put myself over to the left and shoot the masker from there, then my coverage is blah, 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 blah. And I'm not going to shoot into the windows right. because the sun is going to be setting and, um, you know, or uh, it'll be complete silhouette. I can't have that intercut in a regular lit uh, dialogue, you know, so it informs me of, uh, um, of how I go about my verite. Yeah. It, with something like, uh, Julia or, um, even I, believe, I think RBG to a degree, a uh, lot of, um, archival footage. Yeah. Know? But Go Fauci, <laughs> not so much. Oh, also. Yeah. <laughs> was that actually a consideration? Was you're like, you just have to chuck a bunch in there. I, oh my God. Of course. Oh. You know, I, I started, uh, uh, Julia, my name is Polly Mary. Um, and, uh, what was, what was another doc? Oh yeah. It was the, the code, no, not the code breaker. Oh, um, uh, the ballerina boys, which was a one hour, um, you know, documentary on the Trocaderos de Monte Carlo is a, a ballerina, um, uh, troupe, a male ballerina troupe. And so when you start before COVID, then you have to adjust during COVID. And all of a sudden it was all shrunk down to what is possible. And uh, um, shooting Julia was uh, there for, um, you know, the verite in terms of being with, with cooks in the kitchen. There was like this whole talk about of me shooting people in the kitchen, preparing different recipes that did not happen. You right. know, we tried it and then it became just way too risky of, uh, um, you know, in close contact and, you know, six feet away <laughs> on a long lens with your yeah. heart. <laughs> <laughs> Everything's at 150. You're just like, yeah, right. exactly. But I have to say, you know, using this C500, I was just shooting a project and uh, um, I did so much handheld work on the 135 at T2, 2.2. Wide as opening, and help. That was beautiful. It was Were beautiful. Were you using the no stabilizer? No. no, okay. No not even the electronic one. Nothing. I used nothing, oh. and it was. Uh, um, it turned out beautiful. There was. It, it was a problem because you know with the cinema primes, you can't have stabilization. Um, it doesn't really work when you have not a lens that communicates with the body oh right okay yeah yeah, yeah. so that doesn't you know with a cinema prime it just doesn't work i was able to use i was able to use my nicor primes the old ais ones um with stabilization but i had to key in i had to tell the camera what lens it was ah, okay. i was like oh this is a 50 and then it goes all right but it I, i'm wondering i'd have to look back and see if um and see if that footage looks weird at all because i don't yeah, have any stabilized lenses yeah, I mean, I, I don't either because I, I shoot on primes predominantly. I mean, I'm uh, deeply uh, infatuated with the Canon Cinema Primes. They um, For Julia, I use the predominantly the 50 uh, uh, Cinema Prime because, you know, it gives me close focus to the center at 18 inches. So you're like about eight inches away from the food. Yeah. I mean, that's like smelling distance, you know? Yeah, yeah. Was <laughs> Julia so, on the 300 or the 500? Uh, no, we shot that on the 300 Mark II. Yeah. Uh, because we started out and so I had to stay true to um, that sensor. I didn't want to mix it up. But uh, yeah, you know, at smelling distance, six or eight inches away from the front element of the, uh, of the prime. And boy, that was uh, so much fun because of course you're, focus is very shallow at that point and you you want it to be shallow so that um just the same way as your eyes would focus on something that close you go to the most attractive part which is of course the colors and the juice and that asparagus yeah. with the hot salandais on that you know <laughs> yeah. uh walk me through kind of how you go about um 
lighting just a, a sort of a traditional interview. Like you, you know, you sit down with Anthony Fauci or or whoever, and oh, uh, that was so much fun with Fauci. I mean, you know, it's interesting. My lighting has really changed. When I started out, it was all drama because I came from black and white photography. I loved right. drama and uh, um, four stop but- ratios. <laughs> Exactly, exactly. No, absolutely minimum fill light. But then as I grew older, uh, grew older, um, as I discovered that, uh, um, you know, it is most important to show whoever you're interviewing that they're, they're human, they're vulnerable. There's something in the skin tones that uh, um, is fragile, right? Even though that we all feel so invincible. And so my lighting became much more Vermeer motivated. Jan Vermeer, yeah, that yeah, like yeah. my biggest influence on in life, I have to say and admit. I think, you know, because I studied painting, so the traditional Rembrandt lighting and Vermeer lighting, but the whole Dutch uh, education that I had with uh, Jan, Jan de Hoog and uh, uh, Franz Hals and, uh, you know, all of these certainly influenced my composition, but uh, Vermeer definitely definitely influenced my lighting and so soft single source lighting with very little uh, um, backlight is what you will see in most of my interviews these days and i think that my approach i hated flat lighting really don't like flat lighting but nowadays i shoot usually with three cameras it's a multi-camera shoot for interviews and so if you have women um and you do a fashion light approach uh, you know i love the hudson spider lights um i i really love the um the sky 60 going through an octa um you know and that just with a little bit of a, a you know a bounce card uh, like B board underneath to fill in you know that area right here makes and then of course the right optics and the right filtration uh, makes their skins glow. And I think partly that is due because the, the cinema primes have a wonderful way of how they refract. And so there's uh, this glow that happens through the optics and each lens has a different quality, but that's what I really love and the coloration of it. And so front lighting with multiple cameras then for different angles becomes, you know, uh, looks like a side light, but it's just beautiful because then it falls off. I use a lot of negative uh, fill so that I can milk that and, uh, yeah, in that case, when I do front lighting, then I do uh, some, you know, multi-source backlighting. Mm. Have you yeah. seen uh, a quick little detour? Have you seen uh, Penn Jillette's documentary, Tim's Vermeer? Oh, yes. Oh, fabulous, isn't it? <laughs> I love that documentary. So, well, I'm a giant uh, Penn and Teller fan, but I grew up as yeah. a I grew yeah, up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. was that came out, I, mean, I, I, I think I saw that a while back. Didn't that come out like pretty 10 old. years ago or something or yeah. even further back? But yes, fabulous, fabulous. What's, um, what's your uh, take on the thesis there? Remind me of the thesis because I remember that they were talking about it, but quite honestly, I can't recall. Um, I, camera the, Obscuro. Uh, basically, what, his idea was, yeah, he built a, a camera um, into a room or actually, no, it wasn't even that he, he, his initial thesis was, he, uh, was Vermeer built a camera and painted in a dark room, but then found out he could just use a mirror and kind of shift his head a little bit and could just paint the reflected item, uh, yeah, yeah, perfectly. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Exactly. And it's really interesting because, uh, a couple of my friends, uh, who love painting as a hobby, they have told me uh, numerous times of that uh, some of the images, you know, <laughs> as a friend of mine who just loves famous paintings, you know, by the, that are unaffordable, whatever it is, and she just paints them herself. Mm. And so she takes it and projects it 
and uh, traces it that way on a big canvas. And then she does her own interpretation and alters the colors and, you know, has a blast doing that. But it's very similar to Vermeer's approach, ultimately, because you're you're getting the proportions uh, more accurate, you know. Do you think... With a slight uh, distortion, of course. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you think... Uh, now this is... Now I'm interested. Uh, do you think it matters if he uh, did it by hand, so to speak, or if he... I guess traced is the wrong word, but hello. That's Vermeer's lawyer. <laughs> Sorry, I just need to switch this off. Um, does it matter? It doesn't matter to me at all. I mean, you know, I, I think we all uh, use some sort of tools in order to express ourselves. And, you know, I, I don't paint anymore. I mean, I do some watercolors, but I don't paint the way I used to paint. Um I use the camera and isn't the camera a tool that everybody uses and does it therefore nullify my artistry? I don't think so. I think, you know, it's like just because I use a camera doesn't mean that my lighting is the same or the way uh, that my, uh, the art of exposure doesn't, doesn't apply any longer, you know? So yeah. it doesn't matter to me. And I think that windows or, or sourced motivation, like window light motivation, um, is is always giving the audience, or I should say not only window light, but any kind of uh, motivated source for lighting will tie in your environment and your subject in such a beautiful way that the audience will uh, feel as if they're, they're, the, the window to that world is real and authentic. And so when I set up at location my lighting, I usually go with what I see in the background. And then the foreground of how I do my foreground lighting mimics somewhat what I see and set out in the background. So there might not be any windows around me, but I will create that window to echo what I see in the background in my framing. Because... That is important to me. I, I want uh, um, a sense that how we live and how we uh, present a topic or a person, an expert or a impacted person who's sharing their heartfelt story, that atmosphere, that mood is essential for fine-tuning the audience's uh, receptors of how to soak up you know, the information and ultimately have, uh, identify and have sympathy, uh, empathy. Yeah. How do you, um, do you have any sort of, uh, like compositional, um, inspiration or how, how did, how did you find, I mean, you, you said earlier, you basically, you were born with it, but, uh, how did you find <laughs> that eye? You know, what, what, what interests you? Because it's, it's, uh, something that I'm, I won't say I'm struggling with right now, but I, I'm wondering if if there's something left on the table that I'm not finding with my with my compositions. See, I or how am, did you train it? You know. Yeah, it is. It's so interesting. I think for me, um, I think the most important thing for documentary, especially cinema verite, is to train your curiosity rather than being concerned with my composition. Yes, it is important how you choreograph your shot or how you, you know, um, kind of use the form. I think for me, it's just because I had years of training and I grew up in a very artsy household that that was just part of the nature of things. But I find when I'm teaching to my students, the one thing that is incredibly difficult to uh to sync up with them is how do you access your curiosity? Because if you are with friends, right? Let's just say, here's, here's a perfect example. You're playing a game. It's game night at your friend's house. You're coming over. It's an interesting game that's fast, full of laughter. Where does your eye go to experience what's going on? Right. Because you don't want to miss a beat because you're in competition. So your your heightened awareness will uh, make you feel very focused. So that is the type of curiosity you want to train 
as a, a cinema verite shooter and also as a you know cinematographer in general because i think when you're curious you find it you know it is when you you know it's so often it is um you got to get into the flow you have to feel pretty organic with whatever you're in whatever your scene is that you're trying to capture if you personally and emotionally don't connect then your curiosity is not activated and so i think that that for me is the key you know you yeah. got to find a way in by being motivated and curious about what's happening and if that is there then it will fall into place because you just want to get close or you just want to step back or, you know. And that informs lens choice as well, right? If you want to get closer, if you want to get a wide. Yeah, so place. interesting because, you know, these days I shoot so much of the Verite on, on Primes, which has, uh, uh, which is great, but it also has its pitfalls um, because you have to switch lenses, you know, at an opportune time right. or, uh, if you know on the uh, interesting I go back to my favorite lens now which is a 50 millimeter cinema prime uh, by Canon um, I end up uh, um, using that as my verite lens for full frame yeah because full frame it's just uh, you know the the playground it's like my canvas is just so big that a 50 feels like a 35 and um and then it becomes easier to just step closer. But when you're shooting on just uh, um, the Super 35 sensor rather than on full frame, um, I would go to the 35. But it also means that when you're stepping close, your subject will know that you're close. Yes. And that yes. has a psychological power. And they have to accept you. But then you're also giving them notice, hey, I'm coming close. You know, I want to be close. And uh, there's a, um, a psychological uh, play there where silently you can demand a response. I can walk up to somebody who is in dialogue, who hasn't said anything or just listened. But the minute I walk up, I'm demanding a response and they will feel it and then they want to say something. Or they'll walk away. Either way, you know, it, it, there's a certain amount of um, as if you are in the conversation, but silently with a prime lens. Whereas when I switch over to my other favorite Canon lens, which is the 17 to 120, uh, which uh, um, I shoot on the uh, Super 35 uh, sensor with uh, in Verite. And that will, you know, goes to a 120. I mean, you, I can be at a distance and still get a close up. And nobody knows. And so yeah. it's more observational rather than being in the action and letting your subjects know. So it's like it sometimes, you know, there's pros and cons. But the prime lens also, and this is the last thing I'll say to that, is uh, you have to have the space. You know, it's like if you're in a small space, prime lens, I find uh, um, you... you you have to accept the fact that when you're using prime lenses, you got to move. You have to be able to move and dance with everybody in the room. You know, in terms of going over the shoulder, you got to come up close when you're on the 35 or the 50, right? And if you're switching over to the 135, you know, you got to make sure that you have uh, um, that, that playfulness, that tilts up and down to whatever activity it is or like I had the scene where everybody was uh, sharing with six uh, wonderful women who were sharing a, uh, and reminiscing about photos and they were sharing it and I was on the 135 and I was uh, super tight and I was just able to float perfectly to these little um, you know uh, tiny photos but you could right. still see them uh, and even though it was a shallow depth of field, but you could really uh, carve out where the focus was and then going back up to their beautiful expressions and their little stories. Um, but then it becomes a smaller playing ground in which you operate. I also like to think of um, shooting Verite as 
if you're writing. It's like mm. shooting in sentences. I don't go in and just like, oh my God, it's, you know, run and gun, just point the camera and shoot. That's kind of like as if I say in a sentence, house or tree, and it's just fragmented, right? But if you think of it as once upon a time, there was a house uh, in the woods, right? you already know that there's a surrounding, a location where you're singling out something. And my next sentence is, is, and I was ringing the bell, but there was no bell to be found, right? So then you already have that interaction. So if you, in your mind, write the sentence and then translate it into a, a visual sentence, then you have like mini masters and these mini sentences of panning from one element to the other then become very much, uh, you know, a sentence, a paragraph, a story. Yeah, no, that's fantastic advice. Uh, and, and also like a, a lot of the documentarians I've spoken to have all spoken about that interaction with, uh, the, I think uh, I'm, I, am I vanishing hmm? in terms of lighting? Let's see. If oh, it's a little dark. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if you can see me still. <laughs> well, we're, uh, we're actually coming up on time. I was gonna, um, we can unfortunately do this. Wait, 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 wait. just, yeah, move it, move it over. <laughs> Going to, going to uh, see like this. There you go. Uh, well, I'll uh, I'll let you go in a sec. I actually did have a quick question about uh, filtration and full frame. I have found that shooting on the C five hundred, I don't really use diffusion anymore. I found that having all the pixels has made it so that everything kind of is naturally smooth, and putting filtration on just makes things fuzzy. Have has have you kind of seen that? You know, it's interesting. I haven't paid that much attention to it, but it probably is why the uh, I used the, the Hollywood Magic uh, filtration for the Julia uh, Studio kitchen shoots. And mm. maybe that's why it worked so darn well. You know, I have to really do a, a um, comparison, which I haven't done, um, because I find that the lensing is so super sharp and, you know, the filtration that I use is, uh, oh, I used a quarter. Mm, yeah, that's that's the fusion. But beyond that, I usually shoot without. Yeah, it's really more for I use. Uh, I don't use Promis anymore. I um, I did a documentary uh, called The Bit Player, where I had four different uh, um, uh, periods that I had to portray. One was the 1920s. One was uh, 1948. One was in the 80s and then the present time. And um, during that time, uh, just playing with heavy filtration, especially for creating like a silver printing look and uh, obviously for the noir look, um, I used the these wonderful, uh, you know, uh, soft FX filters like yeah. one half and one, you know, because it was shot at night and it worked beautifully. I mean... There was, uh, uh, it was fascinating to me. I would have never dared from my previous experiences to, to uh, push the envelope with heavy filtrations, but uh, it just called for it and it worked really well, you know. But again, there's so much you can do in post these days. I mean, if I uh, do my color correction in, uh, in post, sometimes I lay over, you know, a grainy look just because it uh, needs to look more filmic or, um, you know, more like 16 millimeter. Uh, sometimes I just literally create shafts of light. Yep. You know, it's like, okay, I, you know, you got to just give me a form right over here with a couple of shafts of light. <laughs> I didn't do that in Fauci though. Fauci was all real shafts of light. Yeah. No, that's set. something I, 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 I agree. Like nowadays I'm kind of, uh, getting the cleanest image I can or, and even yeah. that both exposure wise, uh, you know, you're collecting data with these sensors. Yeah. Now you're not really creating the image until it hits resolve yeah. or base light or whatever. Um, and then from there you can just massage and do whatever you want. Um, uh, like I said, we are coming up on time, which is unfortunate. Uh, so I'll, I'll, I like to wrap it up with, uh, the same questions. And since you're a documentarian, there's actually a third question. So, okay. uh, the first one is, uh, 
can you recall, it doesn't have to be the piece of advice, but can you recall a piece of advice that really stuck with you that helped you um, along in your career or maybe life, but probably career? Well, I, you know, the, in terms of my career, I think uh, to get into the business uh, when you're coming out of film school, I advise that you set your expectations to devoting two years to just get into the business. And that perseverance is everything in the, it's 80% of being successful in our business. That's the one thing. The second thing is when you're a shooter, what happens if the scene is really exciting to you, then time warps. Yep where you go and you hold on an amazing emotional reaction. And then you say, oh my God, that was so amazing. Okay, now I get the other one. And you rush because your adrenaline is at, at, you know, so ignited that you are cutting it too short. So don't be fooled by your own adrenaline when you are in a highly emotional cinema verite scene or in an action packed scene. Count to 10. That's my advice. Hold your horses before you move the camera. Obviously, if it's an action, then you just follow organically, but um, hold your horses. Count to 10. It's a simple thing, but it, uh, in the edit room, you'll, you'll be happy to have done that. Yeah, the, uh, I'm, I'm nodding and smiling because uh, for the longest time, I, I, so I shot, used to shoot concerts. Right. Uh And uh, that was a lot of fun. And when something cool would happen, I had this instinct to stop rolling. I would get really excited and then I'd hit the button and try to get another shot. And it was just like I'd get in the (laughs) edit and I'm like, what am I doing? (laughs) And for the longest time, I would just shoot at 60 so I could slow it down and give myself a tail. (laughs) That is it. That's a that's interesting. Very lazy, but yeah, I have not even now you know, I have to like roll is, my finger off the trigger and just like, yeah, it, it is. Don't touch it. Don't touch it. I know the, the trigger can be, uh, um, tricky. Um, there was a time period when I would be shooting on the C 300 the first model. Mm. And, uh, when you would, uh, record you all, you have, you have your display, but I don't like the display because it compromises, um, my, uh, sense of composition. Yeah. And I have to have a clean, you know, uh, image in front of me and not cluttered with details. Nowadays, you can do so that it's yeah, just on the, the border yeah, one. Yeah, exactly. yeah, yeah. But if you would click display off, it would also remove your record display. Right. <laughs> yeah. Right. And so I have been, unfortunately, in the situation where I was sure I was recording and I was like, whoa, this is the coolest thing. And then, uh, yeah, okay, cut. And I clicked it and then it started recording. It's like, oh my God, what did I do? And that is, you know, the hardest part because that's when you have to own uh, your mistake. And I think it is important that... um, you don't fear that, that you can go up to the director producer and say like, I am so sorry, but I had technical difficulties. It just turns out that this last scene, I didn't capture. What I got I all thought? the conversations in between. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, I'm sorry. We will just have to find another way to bring that to, that topic back up for them to discuss you know do it while you're there don't do it uh, don't don't you have to it's like the responsibility it's yeah. the right thing to do to be truthful you know well um, and I, and uh, something i learned working for i used to work for red bull and i made a mistake that stuck with me forever but uh, just for anyone listening pull someone aside and tell them that don't run up oh, to the director yeah. and shout the mistake oh, you've yeah. made, <laughs> pull them aside quietly, <laughs> whoever it is, or if you have to reprimand someone even worse, but like, yeah, I don't, know. don't do it in front of everyone. Do it softly yeah. to the side. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. That's set etiquette. Very, very important. Yeah. Uh, second question. 
a little easier. Um, a movie that you think people should see. Any movie. Okay, for uh, for documentaries, my all-time favorite movie right now is still Honeyland. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Honeyland is a movie that completely uh, embraces, you know, beautiful lighting, great composition, great verite. Images really stand by themselves and tell story. Um, there's, it's just amazingly beautifully photographed. Of course, they had three years to do so, you know, and uh, complete access. And sometimes that is key in order to be uh, playful. But there are just moments in there where you go like, oh, my goodness, how did they capture that? You know, when the little girl nearly drowns, they were right there and photographed it. And my, my heart was racing. Just did they not have that responsibility to yell out? Because you don't see the cameraman shifting, you know, away from it. He just holds the camera, a cameraman. I, it was a cameraman, actually. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but holding, holding on the water with the kids all playing, right? Hopefully. You know, the director was actually alerting the parents because then she was rescued right away. But, you know, those moments are the moments when the, the little baby, the toddler is being stung by the bees, you know. And you keep thinking, as a filmmaker and as a camera person, don't you have the responsibility to stop everything and rescue the kid? But again, we don't know if not somebody else is being... You can cut that audio out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. You can cut that audio out, right, right, right. Or yeah, you can be filming yeah. and go, help. <laughs> <You know? laughs> exactly, exactly, exactly. So anyway, that is one of my favorites. But there are so many. I mean, I, I uh, gosh, right now I love the film The Rescue. Um, or the not the rescue, yeah, not the rescue. I, I love that film too, but I really thought that uh, the first wave, um, shot by um, a dear friend of mine and some uh, other DPs as well, but he did the most. Uh, Talk about Thor. Thor, yes, exactly. I interviewed him about Boy State. Oh, fantastic! Yeah, we worked on Boy State together. So I did we see have that. Like, we have this camera collective. There's six of us, and. Uh, we jump into each other's uh, shoes quite frequently because, you know, documentary schedules can overlap and sometimes you're not available, but you have started that project. And so we wanted to create a group that can really support each other where we all can easily adapt to somebody's style and have the experience to um, be just, you know, a good fit and also put the uh, directors and producers at, at, at ease. Yeah. And so we have this uh, um, camera collective and uh, Thor had, you know, said, look, I'm doing this film on Boy State. There are 1,700 campers. I cannot photograph that by myself. <laughs> I want our old, my our team to go and we work as self-directed DPs. Each person will get a character and that's how we're going to make it happen. And we did. It was great. Yeah, Thor's awesome. I loved that conversation. Yeah, he's fantastic. Yeah. Um, and so he shot uh, uh, the the first wave, which is a beautiful film, and I would not be surprised if it isn't uh, nominated. Matter of fact, aren't the shortlist supposed to come out today? That's a good yes, question. Yes, they I actually just that. came out. Oh. Um, Claudia Julia is actually on the shortlist for documentary feature. Hey. Uh -huh. That's nice. That's yeah. sweet. That's and, so cool. And um, the first wave, I believe, is also on there for documentary. Fantastic. Future. So, so well deserved. I, I would not be surprised if the first wave is uh, going to be uh, landing a nomination. Yeah, you uh, guys are going to have to fight about it. Um. <laughs> we don't fight. We just are very supportive of each other. <laughs> just steal each other's like trophies. Just like, oh, where'd it go? I don't know, but I have one at my house. Um <laughs> Third, the third question uh, before you fall completely into darkness. Uh, oh my goodness! Hang on, I wonder what I can. Oh no, do. it's fine. I'll I'll brighten it up and post. It's fine. Okay, that's um, why you on the five hundred. Yeah. Well, and I've got lights. Wait, and I can, it is I also can, two o'clock. Here. Hang on. Hit us with the cell phone. <laughs> yeah. I, 
Well, if it would be working. Oh, goodness. Hey, that kind of <laughs> works. Uh, but pretty dramatic. Um, the third question, the documentarian question, recommended footwear. Recommended footwear. So um, when I am in the mountains of Mexico or Peru or uh, Nigeria, then I wear uh, hiking boots. Um, Gosh, what is the brand? Hang on. (laughs) Okay. Yeah. Here for it. So these are my hiking boots. Okay, yeah. <laughs> Those look kind of stylish too. <laughs> yeah, and now I uh, where's my I'm just going to because I've had them for eons, you know, I don't even uh know what brand the they've been burnt off. Yeah. <laughs> there are uh D R Y dry. It just says dry. But this is not it. Nope. Sorry. <laughs> it is Zopa. <laughs> mm, I well, can't. someone's going to have to go on the YouTube and just look at them and be like, those ones. <laughs> Anyhow, they are my favorite hiking boots. They have a really good fit for the heel. Uh, they have a, a good traction. And so I find incredibly supported through these shoes and that's you know what you want you really want uh, a, f- uh, a shoe that doesn't slip and really kind of cusps your heel important mm. to me or i need high arch support so i uh wear nikes well yeah yeah well, there you go works for yeah. me I, I never used to ask that and then after like the fifth documentarian brought up footwear i was like I should just start asking all the documentary because everyone's got a different, everyone has a different answer. Um, and it's, it's kind of funny. And I've got them all in an Amazon list. Oh, really? Oh, <laughs> yeah. yeah just, hilarious. just like a wish list. Or it's not like my wish list, but it's just a list of every shoe that any documentarian has ever said. Yeah. Um, yeah. And maybe I'll make a book about it or something. But uh, anyway, thank you so, so much um, for spending the time with me. I, that was a, fantastic conversation i'd love to have you I back i enjoyed it so much thank you for inviting me kenny i i loved it yeah. um and you now have the challenge of you know what often in in true documentary style happens when you uh, uh conduct an interview or a scene when the light goes down right yeah <laughs> there's, there's gonna be a lot of resolve work done in the last 20 minutes of this <laughs> Um, but anyway i enjoyed it tremendously so thank you so much i'm I'm great very glad to hear that um we'll have you back when your next project is uh wrapped and ready to go fantastic i would be delighted okay well uh thanks again and uh take care okay bye-bye frame and reference is an owlbot production it's produced and edited by me kenny mcmillan and distributed by pro video coalition Our theme song is written and performed by Mark Pelly, and the F&R Matbox logo was designed by Nate Truax of Truax Branding Company. You can read or watch the podcast you've just heard by going to ProVideoCoalition.com or YouTube.com slash Owlbot, respectively. And as always, thanks for listening.